Good evening. Welcome to tonight's Shear. Today is Thursday of Parshas Bihar. Tafshin Hey Dalad. Today's Shear has been dedicated by one of our regular listeners. He listens to the recording, lives in Bangkok. Perhaps I mentioned his name before, Rabbi Avram Shmuel, Shmuel Avram Brill. And he's dedicated tonight's Shear to the Shluchim, the head Shluchim of Thailand. That's Rabbi Yosef Chaim and his wife Nechomedina Kanta and their family. It's now 30 years since they've gone out on Shlichus to Thailand. And it's a tremendous, tremendous Hatzlocha. I'm sure many of you are familiar with. There's also a lot of activity there with travelers, the backpackers, with the, but it's all under the auspices of Rabbi uh, Cantor and Rabbi, Rabbi, Avram, Rabbi Shmuel of Rome is very grateful for them, for their being there and personal involvement. So that's his bracha to them, to many, many more years of atzlocha in their shlichas in good health. Before going into this year, I want to share with you a new development. I've been telling you perhaps uh, on and off about a new edition of the Siddur uh, with or the Alter Rebbe Siddur with resources and uh, comments, which is something which I published about 20 years ago. And now it's a new edition. It's ready to, to roll. It just needs to have a bit of a bit of a cash injection. So that's the uh, appeal page. Anyone who wants to be able to contribute, it's, I know it's a substantial contribution, but Bezos Hashem, so you have here, uh, this the Kohos in New York have put up a page for, for the uh, fundraising for this, and uh, Emir Hashem will be in touch. Um, whoever wants to uh, take a share in this uh, project, as yes, Hashem. Okay, so that's just been launched today. You can see the goal is sixty thousand dollars. As yes, Hashem will get there speedily. Right. We'll come back to that to the end of the uh, end of the shear. And let's go now into our actual shear. So last month of Shabbos, someone calls me up. It must have been about twelve o'clock, and. Uh, he had benched, then he realized that in benching a Motsa Shabbos, he had said Ritze. So he's asking, do I have to bench again? By having, well, because, you know, Motsa Shabbos is already weekday. And he said, he said, as if it was Shabbos, so he included Shabbos stuff in benching. So what you have on the screen here is from the Ksos HaShulchan from Reb Chaim Noyer, who writes that if during a weekday you had said a Ritze in benching or Yalav Yove in benching? So he says, if you're middle of benching, you should go back to that brocha and correct it. But if if you finish benching, you don't have to go back to the beginning of benching. So that you have a clear psak that this mistake does not having said Yalav, um, Yalav, Yalav, or would say when it wasn't warranted doesn't oblige you to go back to the beginning of the benching that's the psak uh, which i found quickly on lots of shabbos uh, say for shiyos miyovin but then i spent some time looking it up and want to share it with you so where does rabbi chaim Noir get his ruling and so he's comparing this first of all to shomoy nasra what would happen if you included something in Shemona Esra, which you shouldn't have? You thought it was well, you, you're half asleep, and you said Yala V'yavoy in your Shemona Esra. So you have to repeat the Shemona Esra. And so this is where we have in the altar of Shechonach, it's Simen Kufches. One who makes a mistake and mentions Mo'ira, the events of another day in a da, in a tefillah, when it's not the right time. So, for example, he said, it's not Or he mentioned Shabbos or Yom Tov stuff when in, on a weekday. So the first opinion says, 
Yesh Oimrim, there are those who say that mentioning something which doesn't belong that day, that's not considered a hefsik. It's not considered an, an interruption to have to warrant repeating the Shmoy Nestra. So the first opinion says it's not a problem. Second opinion says it is a problem, the Yesh Oimrim, that it's as if you had chatted about, I don't know, Arsenal's against Spurs in the middle of Shmoy Nestra. Uh, which has got nothing to do with Davani, yeah, for most of us. So then, therefore, you'd have to go back to the beginning of Davani if you put in something totally foreign to Davani. So in Shwanasra, if you mentioned, if you said Yala Vyava when it wasn't warranted, so the first thing says you don't have to repeat Shwanasra. The second thing says you do have to because it doesn't belong there. Le'inyan halocha, although generally we'll take the view of Sofek Brochus Lahakel, you don't have to repeat the benching, sorry, the other Shimon Esra, but in, in Shimon Esra, the recommendation is, since there's the famous Loshon of Rebbechenen, Halavai she is padal laha odom kolayim kula kolayim, a person, Halavai, I don't know what the English word for Halavai is, but if only you could say, you could daven a whole day, wonderful. So therefore, davening is a good thing anytime. So therefore it's recommended that in this case, a person said Yalav Yavu when it's not warranted, he should repeat the Shemona Esther. But you see it as a, a Nadav, a Tudos Nadav. So what we're seeing, it's not so clear cut that by mentioning something which is out of order for the day, warrants that you repeat it. Shemona Esther, okay, you, you, you repeat a Tudos Nadav. But when it comes to benching, there's no such thing as benching a Nadav. And here we have from Taka, Bichas Bichasemosen, in Kuchpei Gimel, where it talks about, in the olden times, it was, the style was, the Mizamein, the leader of the benching, would say the benching aloud, and everyone else was listening. And so the people who are listening shouldn't be talking about anything whilst they, about other stuff, whilst they're listening. Um, now, just like the one who's leading the benching shouldn't be talking about other stuff, so they also shouldn't. If the listeners did violate and they did chat about unrelated stuff to benching, but it was between bracha and bracha, and it was at a moment where the leader of the benching had fallen silent for a moment. So here we're seeing that in benching, if you, yes, even if they put in something which was totally irrelevant to the benching, they don't have to repeat the benching. And how much more so in the case of re putting in Yalav Yavi or something, which even a Shemona Esra, there's a Svara to say that you don't have to repeat the benching. So therefore, so that's the, that remains the bottom line. That if in benching on Motzah Shabbos, or any time of the week, but even benching, you did include the say when it wasn't warranted, you do not have to repeat the benching. Okay, very clear. Let's move on to the next question. So a woman asked me this past week, she's expecting and sometimes has extreme thirst. Um, and I was taught by my late mother, Lea Sholem, that when a woman is pregnant, you really go, well, if she needs something, whatever food, whatever it may be, you get, you get it, uh, and you try very, very hard to get it. My mother used the word, even if it's, you get fagel milk, which means milk from a bird, which obviously doesn't exist. Um, so you, you, if a woman is pregnant and she needs something, you really try to accommodate that need. So now she's got this, this strong thirst and she's asking, sometimes it might be she's in the bath, sometimes it's going to be on a Shabbos, she hasn't heard Kiddush. So can she uh, have her drink, have a drink of water then? So very, very interesting. There's a Gemara in Shabbos Daf Mem Aleph, which says the following, that if a person, it's all talking about protocol for bathing. And it says there, Rochatz Bechamin Veloy Shoso Mehen. If someone bathed in hot water and did not drink from them, from that water, now that, you see, there's a, a comment there, there's a little gimel suggesting that the word Mehen doesn't belong. Uh, we'll, we'll see that in a moment. So if a person bathed in hot water and did not drink, if 
It's as if it's comparable to a, an oven, which has been heated on the outside and the inside is cold. So it's important to have hot water inside your body as well on the outside of your body. So it looks like the Gemara is suggesting that you should have a drink when you're in the in the bathhouse. And you're in nice hot mikveh. So that's mibachut. So you should also have hot water mibifnim. Okay. So then Rabbi Yaakov Emden, in his comments on that Gemara, he says, he doesn't mean you should drink the bath water. And he gives a reference to a Gemara that bath water may not be a good idea to drink. But it means you should have hot water. And that's, he says, that's implicit in Rashi. But then he asks a practical question. How can you have a drink of hot water in the bath when you can't make a bracha there? Because people in that area, by there, they are, they are, they're standing undressed. You can't make a bracha when people are undressed. Do it yourself. And he says, well, possibly the drinking here is not a drinking for thirst. But rather, it's like the story if a person is, feels they're choking on something, got something stuck in their throat, so the Gemara says in Barachas that you should, that you don't make a bracha when you're having a drink of water just to swallow. So let's say people using pills uh, and they need to have a drink of water. You would not make a bracha on that water because you're not having it to quench your thirst. It's just to wash down the pill. So he's suggesting that this water in the bathhouse perhaps is a similar thing. It's not because of thirst. And since it's not for thirst, therefore you don't have to make a bracha. That's Rabbi Yaakov Emden, which doesn't help us in our case because the woman is experiencing thirst, and therefore she, she would have to make a brocha. So then we go on. We have, well, before going back to our, our case, back to the still in the Gemara. So this I found in some, uh, I did a bit of a search on the Yitzhak Chochma, it's intrigued about this brocha or drinking in the bathhouse. So this is a fairly contemporary safer. And he he says that um, that the that the drink of hot water after it was not in the bath, but after going out from the base of Merchats, the, not unlike the way the Yaakov Emden understood it meant drinking, and he gives a reference to tour kasha yoitzin me base So we have he suggests that the hot drink is indeed to warm up the body, but not when in the bath house, but when you're just going out. Then he gives another suggestion. Actually, it's not talking about a cup of water, but it means actually a cup of wine. As we find sometimes that a person has just had um, bloodletting. So there is uh, an idea of him having his, his, uh, depleted his energy in the bloodletting. So to have a cup of wine to replenish the energy. And so they're suggesting the same thing. He's suggesting that perhaps the, the, the drink, which is being said here in the Gemara, is actually a drink of wine. And again, after the bath. Okay, so that Gemara, the Poshtup shot of the Gemara suggests drinking water in the bathhouse and with the attendant problems, a couple of solutions which don't really help us. The question is, what does a, if a person is in, if a person is in a uh, hospital or something and they they have right near them something which has got a very bad smell. Now, you're not allowed to make a brocha in the presence of a very bad smell, an offensive smell. The person has no choice to move or not to move. They're stuck there. Are they? Do they have to starve also? Or are they allowed to have a drink or have food? With it? We can't make a brocha. So can they have food without a brocha? So, sorry, it's not on the screen, but... I did see that the late Rav Vosner was asked this question and he says that if you're onus, if you are, if it's not in your control to be able to make a bracha appropriately, then you are allowed to have food or drink without a bracha. That's that's where he paskins. Of course, at what stage you say, uh, um, I'm desperate. So he talks about and several hours a day, but in the case of this woman who's pregnant, it uh, uh, I would say that, as I said before, you don't delay, and if she needs to, if she's very thirsty, can't make a bracha, she can have a drink without a bracha, make a bracha afterwards. What I did suggest to her is that before she goes into the bath her room, 
she, she's going to prepare, she, she should have a, a, a drink. If she's a bit thirsty, she can make a broch on water. If she's not thirsty, have a drink of orange juice or something, but have a, a drink of, uh, make a shahakal before you go in and you anticipate you'll be thirsty. Okay, so then that's what I suggested to her. Make a broch before you go in and then problem solved. So she got back to me and said, what about the problem of Ruach Ro? Of There's a general um, general approach uh, that we don't take food into a bathroom or toilet because of Ruach Hatum or something like that. Now, that is true, that that's a general minhag. The earliest source for that is one of is from the first Belzerov. So let's talk about 150 years ago. That's the earliest source that you have. I remember as a bocher, I learned in Brunois for a few years, and I used to be um, very Hamish with the Rosh Hashivas, uh, Rabbi Goldberg, Rabbi Yosef Goldberg. And I remember they, 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 they would cache their chickens in the bath. They had uh, like some kind of grid. I mean, it came to cache and chickens, and I, I, I'm, I'm sure I'd seen that uh, elsewhere also, people cashing chickens in the bar uh this is nowadays all of this is obsolete because we buy them very well packaged and all cashed and, and sliced and uh, whatever but when people used to cash things chickens at home i believe it was quite common that people did then did it in the bath and they didn't say oh it becomes ruach raw and okay so it's not such a big issue this ruach raw business then the other so that's that's not such a big issue as far as i'm concerned uh, if she needs so, so this, she could have a drink in the bath. Broch is the issue, but not the Ruach Ro. I don't see that such a big issue. Okay, so necessity. What about on Shabbos? So before Kiddush. So there is something not to have a drink before Kiddush Friday night. That's written clearly in Shulchan Aruch. Even water. Shabbos day, different, uh, the two opinions in Shulchan Aruch, whether you're allowed to or not allowed to, Eat or drink before Kiddush. By Havdola, I mean, Haddin, you are allowed to drink before Havdola. It's the Minich Chabad written, Hayyamim, is we don't. So there is room to be make at least in, by day and uh, before Havdola. What I would say, well, I'm, I'm wondering by night, okay, if if she's desperately thirsty, so take a cup of wine or grapes. You should make your own Kiddush and, and uh, so, oh, if you can't handle grape juice, do, 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 do and I'll make a cup of tea. But you make your own kiddush. Who says you have to you must, um, suffer the thirst if you need to drink? So, okay, you can you can sort yourself out. Okay, let's move on. We were just recently learning in Gemara and Gemara Yuma about the whole uh, should we call the word fiasco? But where David Amel, unfortunately, was. Um, one of the mistakes which he made, always discussed in the Gemara, um, although he wasn't. So that 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 the, he he called he called for accounting of the Bnei Yisrael a, a head count, and there was a afterwards there was a plague, and so we were discussing at the table what's the reason why we should not be counting in. So in the Posuk, in the beginning of Kisisa, it talks about giving a half a shekel, and it says, oh yeah, you should give a shekel for half a shekel for each person. There should not be, there will not be a plague by them being counted. So Rashi there says that counting is inviting, or it is allowing Ayn Hora. You set a number. We know this. Uh, this the parallel to this is ein habrocha shoyled el bedova hasoma min ha'ayin. Something which is discreet is a recipient, a receptacle for brocha. Something which has been more quantified, then it's not a keli for brocha so much, and that's what Rashi is saying because it's a set number. Oh, it's this is the number. And that's going to bring, invite that there will be a, a plague as we find in these times of dog. Um, just an interesting comment. There was never a comprehensive count of the Bnei Yisroel back in the desert. Of course, you're going to say there was a count with the Master Shekel. Now, it wasn't comprehensive 
because it only counted males from 20 to 60 and it did not, did not count Shevet Levi. Shevet Levi were counted from the age of 30 days old. And so you do not have accurate data, neither of the younger age or the older age, because you don't know how many, including Shevet Levi, how many 20 to 60s were there? We don't know because we don't know the number of Bnei, of Bnei, Bnei Levi, how many of them were between 20 and 60. So there was never a comprehensive count of the whole of Klal Yisrael. Okay. What I, as I'm looking this up, so you always, you read the Gemara, how David made this mistake. What, why did he, how could he make such a mistake? When there's a posting in Chumash, well, a year by Negev, do a half, do half a shekel so that there should not be a plague. So here you can see the Sifzich HaChomim says that he thought that, uh, there was the count for the Machsas Hashekel to build to make the uh, for building the oil to make the Adonim, and he thought that the that the count with half shekels was because they needed to have the fund for for the for the Adonim. Carbonus, no, Doris, but in subsequent generations, it, perhaps it wouldn't apply. Then he says another point that when it says Bahem Nega, perhaps he, he didn't see that the counting is inviting a negative. Rather, he says, your count, and you do a mitzvah, you bring a bonus, okay, to stock a tatzel mimovis. If there is some gzardin, so the stocker will protect from it. So he did not see that the v'loyir bohem negev was a, uh, an automatic result, so to speak, of the counting. But rather, it's saying that therefore you'll be protected from a negative. It doesn't say clearly that it counting without, you know, without shtick will 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 bring a a, Shalom, a, a plague. And that's that was how he why he thought it was okay. Unfortunately, it wasn't okay. And as we say the story, we know that there, there was a plague, and that's why we have the halach and the Gemara, which as it says that you're not allowed to count Yidden. In a, in a regular way. Um, famous Sikh of the Rebbe, which says that the Kitsa Shukhanor says to count for your minion, to count with Hoshia Samecha. In earliest form, in Siddur Rashi, it says, I think it's his attempted words of Vani, Beroiv, Chastacho, Ovoi, Vesecho, Eshtach, El, Echel, Kotshacho, Yerosecho. So in earliest form, it has the possibility. To count for your minion, Vanis Filosi. And the Kitsa talks about the Posse Koshia Samecha. And the Rebbe, um, in the later years, and he said, why did, he, why did they change to using the Posse Koshia Samecha? Because we're closer to the Geula, therefore the Posse Koshia Samecha was used rather than the Posse Vani Rechastacha. Okay, well, let's move on. So bread baked in a fleshik a fleshik oven, milchik oven, does it become fleshik milchik? And two parts of this question: What is the status of the bread baked in a in, in an in an oven, which is milchik or fleshik? And the other one is: Are you allowed to bake milchik bread or fleshik bread? Now there is a halacha in Gemara that you're not allowed to bake. A fleshika loaf of bread, because of the possible michshel of people mixing up and having it with milk, and also you're not allowed to make a milchika loaf of bread. Well, most recipes in, in in England where bread is usually made with milk, uh, we're not allowed to make bread with milk because of the possible worry of the mixer. In Eretz Yisrael, I think I mentioned this before, everyone knows. That barekas, which are square, are parav, and barekas, which are triangle shaped, are milchik. Every kid knows a triangular bareka is milchik, it's got cheese in it, a square one will be potatoes or something like that. But it's, that's not such common knowledge in this part of the world. So the, if you did want to make a milchik of bread, you'd have to make it in a specific shape that people will know that this is. Um, unusual, and it's milchik or 
I guess you have to have create another kind of shape for flesh shape, but you'd you'd have, you'd have to make it in special shape. So now we've got here then two questions. One is, does the bread become milchik or fleshik? And number two, um, are you allowed to do it? So one connects to the other. Now let's read carefully this lotion from, as you can see, it's Yeridea, Simit Sadike. Beitzo shenispashlo b'mayim b'kdeiro choyleves. You have a milchik pot and you boiled an egg in water. So, para food in a milchik pot. Muta losses oisa betochatar nagoyles. You are allowed to take that egg and use it for stuffing a chicken. Afilo lechatchila. So your egg boiled in a milchik pot remains para to the point that you can now still put it into a fleshik dish. If it was nisbashlo bekdeirim abos, if the egg was boiled together with meat, even if it was the egg shell was on it, also then it becomes fleshy because it was cooked with meat and despite the shell in between, it's going to be the egg is going to become fleshy and you wouldn't be allowed to have it with kutach, which was some kind of tahina or whatever stuff made with lots of milk. So this is the position of the mechaber, of the, of the Rabbi Yosef Karo, that the power of a food cooked in a milchike pot does not become milchik. Ve'yesh math says the Ramo, ve'yesh machmirin bitzliyo u bishu. There are those who take a stricter view that if it wasn't just placed in a milchike dish, it was actually cooked in a milchike dish or roasted in a milchike dish, lesser noisen tam bar noisen tam, that we're going to say that the taste of the dish, or the pot rather, is going to enter the food Again, so you've got, you've got the, the milk has been absorbed in the pot, and now the, the milk in the pot is now going to be absorbed in the egg. So that's notion time by notion time, a taste from the food into the, the milk you put in the pot, and from, from the pot into the, into the power of the food, and therefore it's got a milchika character to it. So we've got two opinions. Does an egg boiled in a milchika pot become milchik or not? Chabas says no, and Amos says others are machmir. So the meaning is that the egg boiled in a in a milchik pot would be considered milchik. But and therefore, in the example of can you now use that egg to stuff a chicken? The answer is no. Uh, whereas not lachatchila, but the evet, if you took that milchik stroke power of egg and put it into a, a chicken then it would be mutabuchol in so coming back to the question we're talking about an oven which is not mamish the same as a pot because there's the contact of the food with the oven is less but taking that approach bread baked in a milchik oven is not fully milchik it's something which you would avoid lechatchila having with meat and but if but it does not cause any issue if the mix-up did happen and the same thing chalas baked in a meaty oven so we wouldn't have cheese with those we wouldn't have them with cheese or with butter but if the, if it did happen it didn't it's it's uh it doesn't make anything tray if that's the case certainly it's not a problem to bake Chalas in a milk in a fleshik or milchik oven, although they're going to be lachatchil or milchik or fleshik, whatever it may be. But if an accident happened, it's not so terrible. And therefore, you are allowed to bake your chalas in a fleshik oven and so on. What is normally done is if you make cake and you do in a fleshik oven and you want to be able to have your cake with a cup of coffee with milk, so then the minig is to kasha the oven by making sure it's cleaned and turning on the oven of full heat for half an hour, whatever it may be, for, for a little, for a while. And then we'll consider the oven no longer fleshik or we can parve. And then the cakes which you bake inside, the oven will then be considered totally parve and you could have them with, with milk if you wished. Let's move on. So one of our 
Shluchim here in the United Kingdom. He is in a community where there's a fairly large Frum community. And he goes there sometimes and he was listening to a shear and it came up about the concept of Klishlishi. The Rav there was giving a shear and he was not very uh, supportive of the concept of Klishlishi. So he comes back to me and asks me about it. So I did some bit of some homework. So let's explain what's the story here. There is a rule that in Gemara that Kli Shani Eino Mevasho. So you've got the pot sitting on the fire that's called the Kli Rishon. You pour from that into a bowl, into a cup, that's called a Kli Shani. And the understanding in the Gemara is that food put into a Kli Shani will not cook and therefore it's permitted to do so on Shabbos. Having said that, there is then a another level called Kalei Habishu, foods which only need a little bit of cooking, a slight cooking, and that's enough to change them. And so from the Gemara we learn that Kalei Habishu will cook even in a Kli Shani. Therefore, you're not allowed to put Kale Habishul in a cliche. So, for example, let's say you had a matzah. Matzah is baked. You want to put it in soup. The soup is cooked. Now, food taste, uh, the taste of cooked, the taste of, 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 of baked is different. So, is there kind of, should we say, taking the matzah, putting it into a soup? They can upgrade it from a, a fear to Bishul. A slight upgrade. Now, would that happen in a cliche? Possibly, because it's only a very slight change. And that's that that's therefore should be a problem. To which therefore we have don't 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 put don't put matzah on Shabbos in a cliche of hot soup. So we know that. Does it help if I pour the soup from one bowl to another, Klishlishi? Does that solve the problem? So, and I'll tell you, I've, fallen. I've really never been comfortable with this because I understand Kli Rishon has got the power that it's got heat absorbed in the material of the walls. Kli Shani is weaker because its walls were not on the fire. Therefore, it's, the heat is dissipated. That's the difference between Kli Rishon and Kli Shani. I never got my head around where is the difference between cliche and cliche. I know that there's a transition, there's a movement from one to the other. But if I know that the, the water or whatever it may be oil in a cliche is boiling hot, way beyond Yadze Leder's boy, I don't see what's the difference of the dynamics of a cliche and cliche. It seems to be both on the, uh, on the ebb. And there's a difference. And so now we, what we see here is that this is from the Sefer called Uraim, the Rebeleza of Metz, one of the later Rishonim. And he talks about these things, Kalabish, and not to put them in, in, in Klisheni, and not even in Klishlishi, which is Yad by, because we don't know uh, whether these s s subtle changes will happen even in Klisheni. So he says clearly Klishlishi also not. But we do know that many of us are have been taught that you will make a cup of tea on Shabbos. So you pour from the kettle and on the urn into one cup, on the second cup, and that second cup you can put in a tea bag. That's very widespread, at least in Lombardic, yeah. So and I've got here on the second quote on this on the on the uh, screen is from a sefer from Rav Fardovich who is uh, eminent Talmud Chochem in Kvach Abad. And he writes very much about pouring, you want, you want to make a cup of tea. So he says, pour the water from the meicham, from the urn, pour it into from one cup and then to another cup, and then you can add coffee, instant coffee, tea, sugar, etc. You have some other interesting things there. But he's certainly giving us the green light to to make a cup of tea in a, in a Kli uh, Shlishi. I must tell you that 
I was brought up in, in my house that we had a little, besides the big Shabbos kettle, we had also a small teapot, an, an, uh, an earthenware china teapot, and we put in a tea in that before Shabbos, and that stayed also on the blech, and so we had tea essence, and we would have, um, when we want to make a cup of tea on Shabbos, we use the tea, that tea essence, and poured it into the cup, um, with, with in a glass with with hot water from the urn, and that's how we had. So we we didn't make, we didn't use tea bags on Shabbos, but I'm going to say that many many families I've seen do use them, relying on the concept of klishlishi. So now I'm looking at the Rav Forkash Sefer. Rav Forkash is a contemporary of Al Zangizun, Langeyor. And he, one of his, he's currently working on a series of Sforim on Nechaz Shabbos called Shabbos Kahalocha. His first volume is dedicated to Bishul, and the first chapter he addresses the Klishlishi concept. And he writes the following that the Poskim debate whether Klishlishi and onwards has got the same status. So whatever you're not allowed to do, Klisheni, are you not allowed to do Klishlishi because of the concern that it will cook? Many are mekel, and indeed, and that's broadly followed. However, there are those who are machmir, and therefore, when it's not too difficult, one should be following other methods, which he discusses um, further on in the sefer. So he's he who's you know really a very thorough writer and Thomas Chochem. He's not confident with the with the Kalishlishi story. Now, I just want to add one one uh, argument here, and that is there is a concept of sfex faker, which we often use in working out a halacha. So, with the matzah, does matzah, which is now put in uh, cooked, is it really a malacha? Because you're changing it, is it really a malacha? I don't know. Is klishlishi the same as klisheni? I don't know. So then, okay, we can use a sfex faker strategy and uh, and uh, and. Uh, and let it let it ride. When you say I've got tea which was dried out in Sri Lanka and put in little bags and brought to um, brought to Sainsbury's and Waitrose, and now it's it's never been cooked. I put it into a klishlishi. Either klishlishi does cook or doesn't. I don't have another. I don't have another Suffolk here. To to bring into the equation, so I'm not so confident about it. I'm disappointing you. Sorry. Okay. Let's go on to the next point. Is that someone in Etz Israel? He writes to be says me questions. He's asking me that it's known that the Rambam takes the view that wine for kiddush is only acceptable if it's acceptable on the mizbeach. And therefore, yain mevushal, according to the Rambam, is not valid for Kiddush. And sweetened wine, which has got added sugar, is not valid for Kiddush, according to the Rambam. So, okay. Personal Shtipa Thomas Chochem wants to also be conscientious with the Rambam. So this fellow is asking me the question. I've got yain, which is not mevushal, not sweetened. It doesn't taste so good. And then we've got Yain, uh, which is sweetened, which I enjoy more. So, should I opt to be machmir to use dafka, the, the uh, unsweetened wine, or can I go for a sweetened wine, even though it's at the expense of being machmir like the Rambam? So, we, this is we have here, it's on the screen. This is from the Alter Rebbe Shikhanoruch, Simon Ein Reish Base. And he brings here the Rambam's position that you shouldn't use. Neither boiled wine nor sweetened wine for Kiddush because it's not fit for the Mizbeah. Others disagree and they say that the some, some things are disqualified from the Mizbeah because they've got a bad smell or because they are have been exposed. But something which is boiled that hasn't spoiled the wine, that's okay to use for Kiddush. And same thing, how much more so if it's been sweetened, that it's not there's something wrong with the wine, the country, but it's just that there's something about the Mizbeah. No, you, we shouldn't put a dvash on the mizbeach. We shouldn't put in sugars on the mizbeach. But there's not in nothing wrong with the wine as so. And therefore, the halacha is that you can use sweetened wine 
uh, for Kiddush. And let's finish off the last line, which is the kind of the Pshak, the balance here. It is customary to use sweetened wine or boiled wine for Kiddush. Even if you have another wine which hasn't been boiled, hasn't been sweetened, it's not as good quality. So it's okay to use a better quality sweetened wine, even though as a result you're not Yaitza Kiddush according to the Rambam, because the halacha is not like the Rambam in this respect. I just want to throw in another point, and that is one Shabbos, I, was, I made Kiddush in Shul. And what I do after making Kiddush, I pour in little cups and people can have from Christ Shabrach. I'm sure many shall do that. And just across the seat, across the table from me, was someone who was not Jewish. He was in the process of Giyur. He was, that wasn't known to everyone. He didn't have a badge with a big L plate. Um, and so he was very helpful. He took one of those cups and gave it to the guy next to him. And before I could say boo, the guy had already drunk the cup. And I was very dismayed because it means that this person, the, you know, the person of Anash, had had wine which had been handled by uh, uh, a non Jew. So I insisted from then on that in Ashul Pokidish it has to be Yain Mavushon. And I would say that that should be also standard in any similar setting. Where it's possible you have such a mirchel, keep to yain mavush. I know that I mean, I'm hearing this a lot now. People are saying that the mavush is not as good quality. Da, da, da. All right, but at least in in, in in I think it's something which one should try to have as a standard. Where you have a risk that people who are uh, non-Jewish or chal shabbos perhesi will touch the wine, then to use yain mavush. Let's move on. So this I got here a question a. Shliach just moved out to a city. His his background is he, he from Brazil, where there's the the days are never so long and never so short as we have in northern Europe or northern anywhere, where we've got very long days in the summer and very short days in the winter. So he's working with young professionals, and so he's. Once a month, he's going to do a Friday night dinner with his young professionals. And that's going to be for this is going to daven Mayuriv um, early and we become Shabbos early. And then the other three weeks, he doesn't have this young professionals dinner. Can he be um, Mikabal Shabbos later? So can he one Shabbos be Mikabal Shabbos at 7.30? Another Shabbos be Mikabal Shabbos at 9 o'clock. This is his question. Can he pick and choose one week? Yes, one week not. So let's take a look at Simurej Lamed Gimel. Now we have the famous thing that this Machloikus, when is the end of Zman Mincha and the beginning of Zman Maidiv? So we've got a concept called Plaga Mincha, which is now about an hour and a quarter before sunset. And according to the Rabbonon, Mincha can be done until sunset. And after that comes the time for Maidiv. Rabbi Yehuda says, Mincha can only be done until Plaga Mincha. After Plaga Mincha is the time for Maid. So we have now, between, let's say, this time of the year, between 7.30 and 9 o'clock, according to Rabbi Yehuda, is Man Maid, according to Rabbonon, is Man Mincha. So now, the way it's written in and the Lashon Gemara, we don't have a clear ruling like one or the other. And therefore, we've got this very unusual situation the Ovid Kemar Ovid, the Ovid Kemar Ovid. You can choose to follow Rabbonon. You can choose to follow Rabbi Huda. So you can choose to Dav Mincha at 8.30, and you can choose to Dav Maidiv at 8.30. But you have to pick one or the other. You can't take both. Yeah. So now he's saying, that if you did like Rabbonon, and you Dav Mincha at 8.30, then you can't Dav Maidiv at 8.45. Because either it's Zman Mincha or Zman Mairiv. And if you Davin Mairiv, if you want to Davin Mairiv at 8 o'clock, okay, but then you should be Davin Mincha before 7.30. Because this is this zone is either Mairiv time or Mincha time. You can't have it Mincha and Mairiv time. 
Having said that, many, many shuls do exactly what I just what was said. It, they shouldn't. And they, their argument is they would not get a minion for, for Maidi, but they wouldn't have Mircha Maidi one after the other. Okay, so there's many shuls are, are leaning on that. But that's the position of the Mechaber, that you cannot choose, you have to choose one or the other. The impression you get from the Mechaber is that you should make a lifetime decision. Either you're going to follow Rabbi Huda or you're going to follow Rabbonon. However, Berke Yosef and others, so he writes that he quotes from the Me'iri that it means on the one day you shouldn't be combining to follow Rabbi Chachomim and Rabbi Yehuda on the same day, to have Mincha married within the same zone of between Plag and Mincha and Sunset. But from one day to the other, one day you're following Rabbi Yehuda, one day you're following Rabbonu, he says that is quite okay, and it's not a contradiction because you he brings examples of precedence in Halacha where you can choose one day like this, one day like that, and he says that's okay. So long as they're not Mamre direct in conflict, that's okay. So I, what I did tell him is it's legitimate that one Shabbos is going to be davening Ma'ariv early, and the other Shabbosim he'll be davening Milch at that time. That is legitimate because uh, it's not on the same day. Right, let's move on. Okay, this is a uh, question about Sukim written on T-shirts. It's coming up like a boyma. And some of these T-shirts have got a posuk from Tehillim, Hinim Atoivim Anoim Shevas Achim Gam Yochad. And I'm sure the question has been addressed before, but one conscientious young mother is asking, my boy is wearing such a T-shirt, and he needs to use the room with the Atom Azusa. Does he have to take off the T-shirt each time? Um, this is this is the question, yeah. So I'm sure the question has been addressed before. I did reach out to someone who may have, have knowledge about this, uh, whether it has been a psaac. What I can tell you is that Rabbi Moshe Wiener, who is the fa famous for his encyclopedic work on, on uh, beards, Hadras Ponim Zoke. So in the Koivitz Razash, which was published, a memorial volume for Ibn Zalman Shem and Vorkin, so Ramosha Wiener has a brilliant article about Tzivus Hashem. Now Tzivus Hashem was launched around Tovshin Mem Aleph and, and then, and then you got these kids wearing the emblem, the logo, and it says on it Tzivus Hashem. Now Svois is one of the names of Hashem. So is it okay for the kids to be running around wherever with with the Sivos Hashem. And so the question was both on the word Sivos and the, both, uh, the, uh, the letter Hashem. And he, 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 he explores this very well and he shows how it's, it's okay because the word Sivos Hashem is not a reference to Hashem. The, the Sivos means the hidden are the army of Hashem. So the, it's the armies that doesn't have a Kedusha. And the word, the letter Hashem is a hey, it's not, it's not Yudke Vavke, it's not one of the seven names. So he, he does uh, find that okay. But here we have a posuk, which is a quote straight from, as it says, a posuk from Tilim. Would it be legitimate? Is there, or, or, or there's other way around. Is there a heter that you, that you don't, it's okay to wear it in a place where you're not allowed to bring Divrei Tyre? So um, what I have on the screen is from, I have a sefer called Ginze HaKodesh, which is all about Seamus, etc., and Kedusha of um, script, etc., and he gives a reference, and he 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 brings here about a dollar, which has Hashem's name written on the dollar. So most Pasuans say it's okay to carry a dollar into the Beis Akise, although there are those who are machne. Then in the notes he has apparently a hundred shekel note in Eretz Yisrael at one stage they put on a posuk or several psukim. But it was very small writing. Then, then again, that was dismissed. But then he has the ink of a nosum klal posuk. I don't know what that means. Then he brings from Rav Zeshlem Zalman Oyerbach that it's okay to carry this hundred shekel note into um, in, into Beis Americas, etc. 
He gives a different reason, and he says, it's not as strict as erasing. So to erase um, a pasuk erase, it would be stricter, but taking it into a place which is a mockum, which is not a sneeze a place, is, is less of a problem. And so that's why he allows the carrying of these, these um, banknotes, which have got psukim, he says because it's not you're not erasing it you're just carrying it into a basic you say it's not such a problem and that's as far as i managed to get with my research um i don't like to say this attitude the ink have an awesome cloud the postuk to say that there's no intent of a postuk there in our case i don't know what the bottom's written the banknote but clearly here the intent is the postuk you want to invoke the idea of that this achtus of Eden definitely is the intent to quote the pasuk. So I am a little bit, um, you know, I'm not sure, but we have Reb Shlomo Zalman does have um, a. It's sad to say it's it's not as bad as erasing it. So you wouldn't be allowed to set fire to such a thing, etc., to burn it. But uh, I'm sorry, I didn't. I didn't. Uh, I, it was been on my mind. I didn't. And carried out in the Alter Rebbe Shachanoruch, he has something about not in the in talk about decorations of a sukkah. He talks about not taking a a um, a pumpkin and cutting out, carving out basukas teish for shivas yomim. You shouldn't carve that out in a pumpkin, and because it'll later come to disgrace. So. That that might have an impact on uh, our discussion. I'm sorry I didn't uh, go through that before the year. Now we're coming back to the um, just a little bit of feedback. So if you remember, we had this discussion about about Hagbe, which way to rotate, and do you go half a circle, three quarters, just a quarter? I mentioned last week also the story. Um, I put on the screen a letter from Reb Label Bistritsky uh, saying that the Rebbe had taught him and several other young people to do Hagbe just a quarter. Turn to your left and do it just to one quarter, then you put it down. So here, I, someone, a particular uh, Mishpoche, his name is Reb Mendel Monshein, and he sent me a, a letter, fascinating, that someone told him that the Minhig of putting down the Sifatoda after Hagbe, which is unique to Chabad, pretty much, that was introduced in the time when the Friedrich Rebbe was, you know, he was paralyzed. He would stand for Hagbe, and when you do Hagbe and, um, and you sit down and you roll the Sefer Torah, it takes longer till you're finished. So the Rebbe would stay, the Friedrich Rebbe, that is, would stay standing until Hagbe was done. So in order to make it quicker, they introduced this idea of putting the Sefer back on the Bima. So then that shortened the process and the Rebbe was able to sit down. That's, that's what the, this, this story which is telling. Now here on the screen, we have a letter of the Rebbe to Rav Zevin. And this is in Tov Shin Chov in 1960. And Rav Zevin is writing to the Rebbe that in the shul where somewhere in Shalayim, they had starting, started doing changes about Hagba. And the time was the changes were that they were following the meaning which was done in 770, the shul of Fidikle. So, and Rav Zevin was complaining about this, introducing a meaning which was not the local meaning of Hagba. And so the Rebbe responds that perhaps you might be right not to change the minig, especially, and this is very important, especially this was the minig of Zikni Anash in previous generations, that when they came to Eretz Yisrael, that they followed the minig of Eretz Yisrael, of doing Hagber the way it was done in Eretz Yisrael. Says the Rebbe, however, now that these young people are presumed, are having said we want to do Hagbe, but it's done in 770. 
So to start cooling that off, uh, he says that's cooling off some of the hiskastrus. That's not a good idea. Even if they're overstepping the hiskastrus, um, even if it's it, it, it's perhaps out of order, but to start putting a dampen on hiskastrus, the Rebbe says that's not a good idea. And um, then he says further, that someone who comes into this shul and see, oh, they're doing the hagbar like this, and ask where does it come from? So be, the answer will be minigavi seinu nesiyenu. There is the idea of when they in the base of English, they said, is it an, is the light until Chevron or something? So they've been saying that there is a mile of people come in. Uh, why they're doing it this way? At Chevron. That, that's, that's how the Rebbeim are doing it. What I found very, very strange is that this suggestion that until 1940, Chabad were doing Hagabal like everyone else, and then it changed. Because of the period of Kevin's health, it could be. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not young, I'm not old enough to remember. These things are possible. It would be interesting, though, that how would this change have reached to the Yidden in in Russia behind the Iron Curtain for decades? And I've never heard anyone to say that in Russia they used to do it differently. Furthermore, my reading of this phrase to Rav Zepin, that the Anash, when they emigrated to Israel, they followed Hagbeh one way, which means until then, they you know, Hagbeh the other way. So I'm, I'm, I'm more inclined to say that, you know, that the Hagbeh was done back in Russia, uh, historically was done the same way we would do it now. But what I would suggest is that if you remember last week, I was questioning Rabbi Bistritsky's story that the Rebbe told him to do a quarter turn. Possibly that was at that time that the Friedrich Rebbe is in 770. He's at, in, at, at Davening. They lift the Sefatoire. The Rebbe is standing until Hagbe is over. OK, just do it quickly. Do a quarter turn. The Rebbe will see it, put it down. Then the Rebbe is able to relax, able to take a seat. It could be that's where it came from. And as you remember, if you remember from last week, you were saying that we saw that in 770 it was not followed to just do a quarter turn, and it doesn't fit the brisa and all that kind of you know, the, all the sources you had last week. And so to say it was it was a heroas, sure, because the Rebbe is struggling to stand and to all right, I can understand that, and that would that would resolve the various contradictions. Okay, um, another point of feedback, which is not on your list, it was added to me later. If you remember last week, we had a whole thing about singing uh, of girls in the presence of their brothers. And I brought a quote, a quote from the Kloisenberger Rov. So someone, someone called Reb Svi Levitin, pointed out to me that actually I had misread the Kloisenberger. I had two quotes, one from Rav Fischer and one from the Kloisenberger Rov. Rav Fischer is also clearly talking about families and brothers and sisters, and he is lenient about that. The Kloisenberger Rov is talking about father and daughter. That although uh, their affectionate contact is permitted, and therefore the singing, uh, hearing of the singing of a father to his daughter would be okay, but the closing is not is not talking about brothers and sisters. So yeah, so I stand corrected on that. I'm going to chaparain one last point about going back. If you remember last week, also we talked about rotating, right to your right or to your left. I'm sure you remember this discussion, and. And what I said was that there, according to Tzemach Tzedek, that it's more correct to rotate to your left rather than to rotate to your right because that's working backwards, like working forwards. Okay, so that's how we do it by Boyer Vesholem. So just this week we're learning a Gemara about the pious in the Beis Migdosh. So you have the selection process, which kind of are going to have the privilege to the Karbanas. So you have the way it says in the Gemara, Kuchliyak, Kuchliyar, they're standing, the Koinim are standing around in a circle, and there's a Mamuna, there's a, an awarden or whatever, standing in the middle, and he, he takes off the turban of one of them. This is in the Lishka Sagos, in the side chamber, and he counts from him, and count, he has a, a number, and he goes around and around. And the one who the number, uh, the chosen number finishes, he is the winner of today's selection process. Okay, but there are 13 privileges for today. And so the way the Gemara says is, 
that the one who wins, he's the first of the 13. And the subsequent 12 people next to him, they are given the other 12 privileges in sequence. So we've got here the Koenim standing in a circle, and then the Memunah stops by one of them, and then the person next to him gets privilege number two and number three, etc. Which side? Or, or, or which which way was the warden, this Mamuna? Which way was he rotating? Was he rotating to his right or rotating to his left? Which means, you know, that, and no one really comments on that. At least I, I didn't find anyone commenting on the movements of the, um, the Mamuna. What it does say, though, Rashi says that the one who, the second one, is standing to the right of the first one. So you've got here, Reuben wins the selection. Shimon is standing to the right of Reuben. Okay? So then he gets the second privilege and so on. It follows to me that if the man is standing to my right, if the Mamuna is working, turning clockwise, the man is standing to my right has already been passed. He's behind being rejected by the selection. Selection is past him. So why should he now be given the privilege? Whereas if you say the, the, the Mamuna is working anti-clockwise, so he comes to Reuben, okay, Reuben wins. Then after Reuben, he would move, move further, would be Shimon, stand to the right of Reuben. So I'm suggesting that Sid Rashi says that the next privilege is given to the one standing to the right. So then of the, of the one, the first winner, therefore that would suggest that the Mamuna would actually be moving anti-clockwise, as we discussed about by Bari Bishon. Just to finish off, most especially for those who came late, Bez Hashem, um, very exciting that the campaign for uh, raising funds for the printing of Siddur Rabbein Azokein, you can see it's three beautiful volumes. Bez Hashem, the, in, the inside will be much more beautiful than the outside, and the outside will get torn and, and, and worn out. Um, but Bez Hashem, that's... Uh, been launched and looking for funders to reach our goal of sixty thousand uh, dollars. So there's there's dedication opportunities as you can see on the screen. And so if you are uh, game for dedication, um, let's be in touch. Okay. Wish you all a good night and a very good Shabbos. And we should hear Suras Tovis, Yeshuas and Chamos. Especially from the Eden in Eretz Hakodesh, we should see a Gula Shlema, the Moshiach and Kano, Mehe Ramein Mamish. Good job. Good job.